Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to Finnegan's webcast, Choosing and Challenging Venue, District Court and ITC. My name is Ningling Wang, I'm managing partner of Finnegan's Shanghai office. I will serve as your moderator today. It's my great pleasure to introduce you my partners, Raj Gupta and Christine Lehman, who are the presenters for today's webinar. Christine currently serves as the leader of Finnegan's litigation section. She focuses on patent litigation in the U.S. District Courts and the U.S. International Trade Commission, ITC, as well as the coordination of international litigation and patent office proceedings. Christine represents clients before the Federal Circuit and provides counseling on a wide range of patent matters. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Raj. He focuses his practice on patent litigation in U.S. District Courts and the U.S. International Trade Commission, strategic patent prosecution, and client counseling. Uh, Raj has great experience uh, in a wide range of technologies uh, including telecommunications, optics, internet, semiconductors, software, artificial intelligence, and biometrics. Before I turn things over to our present presenters, uh, I invite everyone to participate by submitting questions. Uh, this is an interactive webinar. Just click on the red Q&A button at the lower center of the webcast interface and type your question into the Q&A window then click Submit. Uh, if we have time, we're going to answer your questions today during the question and answer session, which will take place at the conclusion of the presentation. You may enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the green Enlarge Window button on the top right side of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow webcast help guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. Before we start our presentation, I want to make an announcement uh, for our next uh, program in the series for Finnegan's webinar on July 11. Uh, the title is USPTO Practice, Nuts and the Bolts. Um, to register, you can click on the webcast link in the resource list. And now uh, I will turn it over to Raj and Christine to begin our presentation, Choosing and Challenging Venue, District Court and ITC. Welcome, Raj and Christine. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ningling. Hello, everyone. My name is Raj Gupta. I'm going to start today's presentation, and then um, Christine will step in to do uh, portion of the presentation, and then I will do the end slides. Now, today is May 9th, 2018, and it was May 22nd last year that Supreme Court issued its decision in TC Heartland, and that was a landmark case that really changed the landscape as far as venue is concerned in district court cases. So that is going to be the topic for today's discussion, how things have changed over the last year since the Supreme Court issued its decisions, what lessons we have learned from it, and, and how the case law has developed to answer some of the questions surrounding venue and what questions are still left open for the courts to decide. So moving to slide number two, the first question that comes to mind is, why does venue matter? And here, the, from, from practicing in district courts in the US, people will be familiar of the concept that there are some districts that are known as patentee-friendly districts. And Eastern District of Texas is perhaps the one that comes first to mind when people think of patentee-friendly districts. So why is that? So as it is shown in this chart, which is taken from Price Water, Price, Price Waterhouse Cooper's 
2017 patent litigation study, what it what is shown here is for a number of the most popular districts in the U.S., what are the overall uh, number of cases that are filed in each of these districts, what are the overall success rates, what are the damages that are awarded, and what is the time to trial. And each of these factors plays an important role in the decision-making process for a patent owner when they are choosing where to file their case. And one of the things that will perhaps strike you first is when looking at the overall success rate, the Eastern District of Texas actually has an overall success rate of 54%. And this is a statistics that is averaged over um, last 10 years ending in 2016. So keeping all of these factors in mind, you know, it becomes clear that Eastern District of Texas has sort of Wrote, you know, gotten to the top in terms of being one of the most popular districts for, for patentees to file patent infringement lawsuits. Now, in discussing today's topic, what we have tried to do is carve out the agenda for today's discussion into four different topics. So the, and first of all, we'll set the stage by discussing the Supreme Court's decision in TC Heartland itself. Then we will talk about what are some of the impact that we have seen in, in based on TC Heartland in the filings in the district court and also in the International Trade Commission. There are certain specific issues that, that TC Heartland has raised, uh, namely have patent have the defendants in the patent infringement lawsuits, when when would they have waived the defense of improper venue? And did TC Heartland, was that a change in intervening law such that the, the waiver principles wouldn't apply? And then we will end with some um, questions on topics that where the law is still unsettled and developing but we will we will discuss some of those topics in more detail. So moving to slide uh, four now, the question that was presented to the Supreme Court in the TC Heartland case was, where does proper venue lie for a patent infringement lawsuit that is brought against a domestic corporation? And in particular, or more specifically, the question really presented was whether the word resides as it appears in in the statute 1400b should that be interpreted using the definition that is provided in the general venue statute which is 1391c and we will take a look closer look at these statutes um, in, in just a minute so to set the stage in terms of the background of the facts that led to the TC Heartland decision. So this is a dispute between two companies, Kraft as the plaintiff and Heartland as the defendant. And both of these are, are sort of fierce competitors um, in, in, in what is at issue here, which was really the liquid wa water enhancer uh, market. And these, uh, for, for those who may be familiar with it, these are you know, concentrated flavored uh, sweeteners that you can add to your water bottles to, to make uh, flavored water that is sweetened with, without sugar. So here, in terms of the, the two corporations, uh, or the two uh, entities involved here, the craft as the plaintiff is a Delaware corporation with its principal place of business in Illinois. And Heartland is an LLC organized under the laws of Indiana uh, and headquartered also in Indiana. So here, Kraft went ahead and filed a patent infringement suit in Delaware, and, and Heartland, as the defendant, it moved to dismiss um, or to transfer the venue to Indiana where it's, it was organized and where it's headquartered. The district court denied 
Hartland's motion, saying that the venue was actually proper here because under the law, um, they were shipping a small amount of, of infringing uh, or allegedly infringing goods into the d uh, district in Delaware, and therefore the, the venue was proper there. The uh, Heartland, as the defendant, petitioned for a writ of mandamus to the Federal Circuit, arguing that it does not reside in Delaware for the purposes of venue under the, under the controlling statute, which would be 1400B. The Federal Circuit, it looked at what was the prevailing law and determined that under that prevailing law, uh, this, the, the infringement suit in Delaware was proper. So the venue was proper in, in Delaware. And, and from that point on, then the, that decision of the Federal Circuit was petitioned uh, to, for cert um, to the Supreme Court. And that leads us now to a discussion first of what are the relevant statutes in play here, what is the relationship between the two, and then we'll get into what it was the Supreme Court's decision. So we've mentioned the 1400B statute uh, a couple of times, and that is what is shown in slide six right at the top. So this is a patent venue stra statute that has remained unchanged since 1948. And this basically sets forth two prongs for two prongs for how you determine proper venue. So the first prong says, any civil action for patent infringement may be brought in the judicial district where the defendant resides. So that's prong one. So we have to determine where the defendant resides and venue is proper there for patent infringement. Or, and then this is the second prong, where the defendant has committed acts of infringement and has regular and established place of business. So the second prong, in turn, has two requirements. One, where the acts of infringement occur, and two, where there is a regular and established place of business. Now, there is a, also a general venue statute, and that is 1391. So 1391A, sort of sets forth in the, the, the introduction of when does this section apply, and, and that says, except as otherwise provided by law, and then the residency statute, which is the more general venue statute, that is 1391C, which states that for all venue purposes, and then it goes on to 1390C2, which is the, the general venue statute, which, which states that it can, shall be deemed to reside if a defendant in any judicial district in which such defendant is subject to the court's personal jurisdiction, jurisdiction with respect to the civil action in question. So in other words, that the general venue statute defines the venue to be proper wherever the court has personal jurisdiction. Now, move, the Federal Circuit's reasoning for finding that the venue was proper in, in Delaware relied on the fact that 1391C is the controlling, uh, controlling statute for venue. And why did it reach that decision? Because it had already ruled back in 1990, and this is when VE Holdings was decided, that the definition of corporate residence in 1391C applied also to the patent venue statute in 1400B. And, and the reasoning it, it got there was because the general venue statute was actually uh, modified in, in 1988, and therefore the VE holding interpreted the statute as it existed back then in its decision in 1990. But after the 1990 V Holdings decision, Congress again amended 1391C to what was shown in the previous slide, which is the current version of 1391C. And in evaluating that change, the Federal Circuit said, well, 
by changing from for the purposes of venue under this chapter, which is what the 1391C language was when VE Holdings was decided, compared to what it says today, which is for all venue purposes, Congress actually broadened the applicability of 1391C. So therefore, its holding in VE Holdings remained the current law, which, which compelled it to say that the District of Delaware was the right district. Now, the Supreme Court reversed. And this was a unanimous decision by the court with Justice Thomas writing the opinion. Justice Gorsuch did not participate in that, um, in that holding or in that decision. And here, the Supreme Court held that the amendments to 1391 did not modify the meaning of 1400B, which is the more specific patent venue statute, and basically the held that as it had held previously, a domestic corporation resides only in its state of incorporation for the patent venue statute 1400B. So that is the holding of the Supreme Court. And the reasoning behind the Supreme Court's decision, and, this, and we are now on slide nine, is that number one, Congress did not amend 1400B in all of this time. The only thing that has changed, and it has changed twice, has been the version of 1390C. And, and the current version of 1391C did not contain any indication that Congress intended to alter or change the more specific patent venue statute in 1400B. In, in fact, the Supreme Court stated that when Congress in, intends to make such a change, then it ordinarily provides a, a pretty clear indication of that intent in the amended provision uh, that, is, that is at issue. And here, there was no such indication that it intended to make that change. Second, it focused on the difference between for all venue purposes compared to for venue purposes and determined that the addition of that word all did not did not suggest that Congress intended the court, the Supreme Court, to reconsider its decision in Forco, and Forco, uh, it was the controlling uh, interpretation of the general venue statute and the patent infringement statute as it existed back then. And then number three. It also looked at the current version of 1391C, where in the introductory part, if you remember, it said, except as otherwise provided by law. And by, by having this provision in there, which the Supreme Court called a saving clause, the Supreme Court noted that this current version of 1391 included this savings clause, which expressly stated that the provision does not apply when otherwise provided by law, thus making it explicit that the qualification that, that Forco decision had was found implicit in the statute. And the last point that they made, the Supreme Court made, was that there was no indication that Congress in 2011, when they amended the 1391C, that it had somehow ratified the, the Federal Circuit's decision in VE Holdings, which is what the Federal Circuit was relying on. So based on, on these four main points, the Supreme Court came up with its holding that the, 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 the venue in a patent infringement case for a domestic corporation lies in the state of incorporation. So now we will switch gears and we'll talk about the impact that this Supreme Court's decision has had and we will, we will divide the impact into two parts. And now I turn to Christine Lehman to, 
to take us through the first part of the impact that this decision has had. Sure. Thanks, Raj. Uh, so now we're on slide 11, and we're going to talk about so the first section of the impact of TC Heartland. Now that it has been uh, almost a full year, we can take a look at the filings and see what really has happened. And what we're going to look at is some statistics from both motions to transfer um, and new patent case filings. So our first slide, slide 12, just shows all motions to transfer um, for both convenience and improper venue across all districts. Um, and you can see on this chart there's just a bit of an ebb and flow. The green shows contested motions that were granted, uh, and the red is contested motions that were denied. Um, and we have some blue and gray that were some um, partial or others. Uh, but you can see um, this does help to see kind of the total number of motions to transfer and how that um, there was an overall spike in 2017. But what we really want to focus on is motions for improper venue, because that's the issue TC Heartland addressed. So if we look at slide 13, and we just look at motions to transfer under section 1406A, which is just going to be improper venue, uh, you will see a dramatic spike in 2017 based on TC Heartland. Uh, because in 2017, you had a whole bunch of cases filed in a whole bunch of courts um, and this rather dramatic change in the law. And before 2017, you can tell that at least litigants uh, thought that the law was fairly settled because there were extremely low numbers of motions to transfer on improper venue. And now, if we turn to slide 14, we can see we've broken down these motions to transfer for improper venue to some of the most popular districts and some of the districts that have had the biggest impact based on PC Heartland. So the Eastern District of Texas is very well known. Uh, and again, they have this big spike uh, in 2017, of a whole bunch of motions to transfer were filed, um, but you'll also see the vast majority of them were denied, and we'll we'll get into that a little later. Um, but at least initially in 2017, right after TC Heartland was um, ha came out, there was some reluctance to transfer out of the existing cases out of the Eastern District of Texas. And now, if you look to the next slide, 15, we have the District of Delaware, which has also always been a, um, a popular uh, forum for patent litigation. And you'll see there's a little more of an even split between motions to transfer that were granted or denied. And there's still a spike in 2017, but not that many total motions, um, still only 17 motions to transfer as opposed to 39 in Texas. And then turning to the Northern District of California, another popular forum for patent cases. Uh, there, shown in slide 16, again, no motions to transfer prior to 2017 on improper venue, um, but then they start to happen in 2017 and 2018. So we can definitely see that motions to transfer uh, suddenly spiked in 2017 in response to TC Heartland uh, as everybody tried to figure out whether existing cases would be transferred to the venue under those rules. Um, but the other aspect we wanted to look at is now that we have a year's worth of data is the impact on new filings. Uh, because we certainly have impact on existing cases and whether those were moved, but after TC Heartland comes out, now litigants have to make a new decision of, okay, where am I going to file and where do I have venue? So our first slide, 17, 
just gives you the general trend of all new patent cases filed across all districts. And this is really so you can get a little baseline and see there was, of course, a big uptick in 2012, 2013, a little down 2014, high in 2015, and then it's been uh, still fairly high 2016, 2017, and it looks like 2018 will be about the same. But now, if you compare that graph to just new cases filed in the Eastern District of Texas, as shown in slide 18, you'll see a big drop in 2017, a much bigger drop than we see for all cases, because people, while everybody still, plaintiffs anyway, like the Eastern District of Texas, it is much harder to meet the venue test there now with TC Heartland. And based on uh, estimates for 2018, it looks like it could go down even further for the Eastern District of Texas. Then turning to slide 18, we have Delaware, and you're going to see the opposite effect. Because of TC Heartland and this, the district of where a company is incorporated, and many companies are incorporated in Delaware, in 2017, there's actually a very significant uptick in new patent cases filed in Delaware, and we expect that trend to continue in 2018 as well. So. Essentially, there are fewer cases in Texas and more in Delaware, which is you know, largely what we expected to see, but now we have a year's worth of data to demonstrate it. Similarly, in the Northern District of California, you can see on slide 20, there was a, instead of the number of new cases going down in 2017, as they generally did across all districts, in Northern District of California, the number of new patent cases actually went up in 2017, and it is estimated to go up even more significantly if it stays on track in 2018. And then on slide 21, we have one other court that is is not always talked about in terms of TC Heartland because it does not have venue provisions per se, but in a way it is a place where litigants can go to escape venue provisions. The International Trade Commission has had some, uh, some big swings in the number of new complaints filed under Section 337, but in the last couple of years, those complaints have been increasing. And we don't have the kind of motion to transfer data and uh, new case comparison data that we have for district courts, but we do know that the number of complaints is increasing at the ITC. So just to summarize our statistics, for 2018, sort of looking forward, it's still estimated that the majority of all new patent cases are going to be in three states, Delaware, California, and Texas, and very significant amounts in Delaware, California, and Texas split fairly evenly as TC Heartland uh, and some of the case laws continues to shake out. Uh, and then a number of other jurisdictions are still have maybe around 5%, but patent litigation in the district courts is going to continue to be dominated by those three states. Uh, and there also is this increase in filing of ITC complaints. Now, the impact on ITC filings is a little harder to discern, um, as I mentioned before, um, but it has been increasing and it is largely expected to continue increasing because it offers a couple unique remedies. Uh, it is fast. You typically get full resolution in 16 months and a trial in eight or nine months. And as these courts, such as Delaware, start having heavier burdens on them and get slower, the ITC will remain a very popular forum. Uh, it also has jurisdiction to overall imported goods so you don't have the same concerns you might have in district court of trying to uh, get discovery from foreign entities. And, and another factor that might be 
um, playing into the increase in ITC filings is as opposed to district court, the ITC does not like to stay their case for pending IPRs. And they have generally refused to do so. Uh, so they don't have the sort of slowdown in litigation that many district courts might be subject to. And they also allow you to pursue multiple infringers in a single case without having to, again, under TC Heartland, and it becomes very difficult because you're going to have to meet those venue requirements for um, multiple people. So not every case will be able to be filed in the ITC, of course. Uh, the ITC does have very specific requirements. You have to have an act of importation. Uh, you're going to have to have a domestic industry. And, and there are no monetary damages. So not every case is going to be going to the ITC. And while the number of complaints is increasing, we're probably not going to see the sort of um, doubling and, and big increases that you see in Delaware, some of the district courts, um, because it does have requirements. And it also is not uh, something that a company can do lightly. There are significant resources required to file an ITC case and bring it to trial um, in less than a year. And now I'm going to turn it back to Raj to talk about the second part of the impact of TC Heartland. Great. Thank you, Christine. <clears throat> so what in the second part, we're going to touch on a few issues, but we're going to start with um, finding out, well, what happened to the original case that actually went up to the Supreme Court, the actual TC Heartland case. And then we'll talk about um, situations under which one can waive the defense of improper venue and how does the fact that there is an intervening change in law, how does that affect the waiver analysis? And then the last two topics turn on some specific issues associated with the patent venue statute, namely what is the interpretation of regular and established place of business that has generated quite a bit of litigation itself and and then just briefly what what is the impact of having to prove that the acts of infringement occur in a particular district for venue purposes and then we will end today's discussion with a with a discussion of some issues that are still being uh, debated in the district courts uh, and 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 the law is not settled on those issues. So moving first to back to the original um, Kraft versus TC Heartland case. So if you recall the history, we the district court and in the district court, Heartland as the defendant said, nope, the venue is not proper here. I should be in Indiana. And the Federal Circuit agreed with the district court, nope, that you stay in Delaware. And then the Supreme Court came down and said, the, reversed the Federal Circuit, and therefore remanded the case back to the Federal Circuit, which would have ultimately remanded back to the district court um, to determine whether it's holding, and, and to remind everyone, the Supreme Court's holding is that for domestic corporations, the venue lies in, its, in the state in which it is incorporated. To apply that holding to the facts of the, the, the case in hand, which was the Kraft versus T.C. Heartland case. So here, once the Supreme Court's decision came down, Heartland, as the defendant, was very quick to file a motion to renew its motion to transfer venue, arguing that the Supreme Court just decided this issue and therefore I do not belong in Delaware. Kraft 
having obviously paid careful attention to the Supreme Court's decision, said, not so fast. The, the Supreme Court's holding and decision in the T.C. Heartland decision is limited to domestic corporations. And Heartland is not a corporation. It is an LLC. And therefore, the Supreme Court's holding in that very decision does not apply to the defendant Heartland. It kind of sounds a little bit crazy, but, but that was Kraft's argument. And, 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 it, and it made a valid, legitimate point, which is that the Heartland holding, the TC Heartland holding, is limited to corporations. The Supreme Court did not express an opinion about what is the proper venue analysis for unincorporated entities. So therefore, the district court, and this case was in front of the Chief Judge Stark, um, <clears throat> Judge Stark was left to basically decide this issue all over again, but now for, for unincorporated entities. However, before a decision could be made by the district court, the parties settled, so, so we never really got to know what, what the uh, Delaware's decision would have been for that original T.C. Heartland case, which, which would have been interesting as, as a side note anyway. Now, once the T.C. Heartland decision came down, there were a number of defendants, as Christine pointed out, there was this flood of motions to transfer by defendants arguing that the Supreme Court's analysis of venue for patent infringement cases required the district court that had the case to transfer it out of that district into the proper district. But not all of these motions were successful, again, as Christine pointed out in, in, in her presentation. And, and a large part of that uh, process or denial was based on the fact that the district court would determine that the defendants have waived, have waived their objection to, to improper venue. So there are a number of rules that are within the federal rules of civil procedure that prescribe when a party has waived the venue defense uh, if it is not properly raised. For example, under rule, uh, the federal rules of civil procedure, rule 12H1, a party waives its objection to venue unless that party files a motion under rule 12B3 which would be the motion for improper venue, or includes the venue defense in its initial responsive pleading. If it fails to do that, then a district court can find that the party has waived that venue defense. Now, moving to slide 28, there is an exception to that waiver analysis, and that exception is when there is an intervening change in the law. And, and this is designed to sort of avoid penalizing the defendants if that defense wasn't even available to them at the time they were to raise that defense. So, or or it, it prevents the defendants having to somehow um, be able to predict that some well-established principle of law would later be overturned and therefore they should make that, that objection uh, at, at that time. So, so here, um, the, the district courts really differed in their analysis on whether, whether their, the TC Heartland decision itself constituted an intervening change in law such that it would, it would not be a waiver, or it would constitute as an exception to the waiver analysis. So as it is shown on slide 28 here, there were a number of, 
of, of districts, including the Eastern District of Texas, which said that the TC Heartland did not qualify as an intervening change in law. And then there were other districts um, that, that held that TC Heartland was a intervening change in law. Now, the, the implications of this obviously are, go beyond the patent venue context in the sense that if you, if you interpret the intervening change in law very strictly, then its impact will be that you will be incentivizing you know, parties to be filing motions uh, trying to overturn well-established principles of law. And if you have a more lenient approach, then that's less of a less of a concern, and 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 less of a concern of overburdening the courts um, with this analysis. Now, this issue then came up to the the federal circuit, and in Indre Micron, that was the case where the federal circuit said that typically the waiver analysis would apply, except here the argument that the TC Heartland uh, holding gave the defendants, which was that 1391C was not tied to the specific patent venue statute, that was not available to the defendants. So, so therefore, INRE Micron, it stands for the proposition that TC Heartland is an intervening change in law. So for all of those decisions where the district court would have found waiver, that waiver um, would be sort of excused, if you will, um, based on this intervening change in law. But even the Federal Circuit remanded the case back to the district court in Indre Micron and, and, and asked the district court to also consider if there were other considerations, uh, other forfeiture considerations that would um, be that would also have some relevance here. And what is what is meant here really is that for the district court, the district courts have an inherent power to control their own docket. And based on that, the district court can take into considerations to see if there are other reasons for why the court should still maintain venue even if there was no waiver on the motion for improper venue. And, and, and this could be reasons such as, you know, very, very simple reasons, such as you're only two weeks away from trial. So therefore, it is in the interest of judicial economy or efficiency for the district court to retain uh, venue in that district. Now, the second topic that has really been evolving since in the last year it deals with the second prong of 1400B. So if you recall, 1400B has two prongs, and the second prong requires both acts of infringement and that there is a regular and established place of business for the venue to lie properly in that district. So here, the, there are two important questions that this analysis raises. Number one, who bears the burden of proving that there is or isn't a regular and established place of business? And here the courts are still split. The, there are certain circuits where, where it, it is the plaintiff's burden, and in other circuits there it is the defendant's uh, burden. So that's another area that we will probably see some development to see if there, there should be more uniformity but that's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to focus more on the nuts and bolts of how, what are the factors and how do you determine whether a place is or is not a regular established place of business under 1400B. So the controlling case for that deals with uh, Raytheon versus Cray, which, which was in Eastern District of Texas. And here the facts of the case are that there were, uh, so um, just as background, Cray is a company that sells supercomputers, and it had uh, two of its sales executives that were working in Eastern District of, of Texas. One of them was there for over seven years, 
and Cray paid his salary, reimbursed his business expenses, and the employee worked out of his house, out of his home, and he he contacted and sold products to customers using an Eastern District of Texas phone number. And, and then there was also a second employee who also worked from his home who also resided in Eastern District of Texas. So the, uh, so the judge in Eastern District of Texas, Judge Gilstrap, he came up with a flexible four-factor test and those four factors are articulated here in slide 32, um, saying that number one, there needs to be a physical presence in the district. Two, that the extent to which the defendant represents itself as having a presence in that district is important. Number three, uh, if the defendant derives any benefit from its presence in the district, like for example, if there are uh, revenue from sales. Uh, number four, the extent to which a defendant targets customers in that district as well. So for example, by, by doing customer support or marketing in that particular district. And this was a very flexible approach. Um, you know, not all four factors needed to be present. And that under that analysis, um, the Eastern District of of Texas held that the venue was proper in Eastern District. The case was appealed to the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit reversed and it rejected the four-factor test. And its primary reason for rejecting the four-factor uh, test was that it was not sufficiently tethered to the actual language of the statute, 1400B, which said you know, it, it has to be a regular and established uh, a regular and established place of business of the defendant. So, based on that language, the Federal Circuit articulated that there are three requirements for proving a regular and established place of business. Number one, it has to be a physical place, and this cannot be merely some virtual space or or the fact that you're having electronic communications between people who reside in that district. No, there has to be a physical place. Number two, there has to be a regular and established place. And by regular, what is meant is that there, there has to be some steady, uniform um, presence. It can't be just sporadic or it can't be just a single event. And then as far as it being established that it has to be settled or it has to be certain, it has to be fixed permanently. So there needs to be some, some aspect of permanence present. <clears throat> and then the third and the, the most important factor for the, for the facts in hand here was that it has to be the place of the defendant. It can't merely be place of the employees of the defendant. And here, there are a number of factors that uh, were relevant. For example, does the defendant lease or own in any way the, the homes of the employees, and which was not the case here? Does the defendant condition employment of the employees uh, based on the fact that they work from home uh, in those locations? That was also not the case. There was no inventory or, or anything like that um, kept at home of these employees. So, so all of these factors taken together led the Federal Circuit to conclude that that last factor, that the, that the place must be a place of the defendant was not satisfied here and therefore it was not a regular and established place of business for Cray, and therefore the venue was not proper. So as you can see, it's, it is a very fact-intensive inquiry because even if you have these three requirements, how are these three requirements satisfied? It depends on the particular facts of each case. Now, moving to the next slide, the, the acts of infringement is, is is one of the two requirements under the second prong of 1400B. 
So here, because an act of infringement in the district is also required, it it you know it makes people, it especially the plaintiffs, think about. Uh, especially plaintiffs for NPE cases, think about whether they want to shift the focus from the manufacturer to maybe only the retailers so that they can get a more favorable venue. Um, it also, questions also pop up where in instances where you have both a foreign entity and a, and a related do domestic in entity, uh, do you want to somehow treat those separately uh, by not naming the U.S. entities and having only the foreign entities. And we'll discuss that a little bit in more detail in the next couple of slides. And then there's another um, issue that is there with acts of infringement, and this occurs in the context of Hatch-Waxman cases or ANDA cases. And this is an issue that is quite complex. It is evolving and it is hotly debated currently. And, and, and so we're, we don't have the time to adequately address that. So we're, we're going to skip over that portion of, of uh, you know, this d debate, and we'll leave that for a future presentation um, uh, on this topic. So that leads us to the final section. Um, we should, what we're going to do here is, in this final section, we're just going to touch upon uh, three or four important topics where the district courts and the practitioners and the clients are still wrestling with what is the right answer here and the law continues to develop. The first one deals with unincorporated entities. So if you will recall, the, the T.C. Heartland decision is limited to domestic corporations. So the question comes up is, how do you treat uh, reside for unincorporated entities? Is it, is it the same analysis? And some courts have come out and said that the analysis for the venue for unincorporated entities is the same as that for the corporated entities in that, in that you look to the state in which its principal place of business would be. Or is it something that's broader than that? And this is, a again, a question that ultimately will get resolved, but right now there is some uncertainty surrounding this analysis. The second topic deals with foreign corporations, and in particular, how some litigants are trying to use the, the, the foreign corporation as an anchor for venue to, to get venue for even the related corporate entities for which the venue would otherwise not be proper. And, and here, as far as foreign corporations are concerned, there is a specific provision under 1391C which, which says that the, the, for a foreign defendant, it may be sued in any judicial district. So, so based on that fact, that, that a foreign entity can be sued as, as, as a venue is proper in any judicial district, then could they also then tie the related uh, other domestic entities in that same district because the foreign corporation can be sued in that district? So here, the, the, this pops up in the context of related entities and whether um, a, a, a plaintiff can base venue on the operations of a defendant's company's related entities to get venue for the other entities. And here, most of the, of the district courts that have decided this issue or ruled on this issue have held that the operations of an affiliate cannot be imputed to the defendant for the purposes of venue. And in part, that is also related to the expressed language in 1391C dealing with foreign entities to say that you know it cannot be used to get venue for other corporations. Now there is also a possibility that that in certain instances the courts may look to see what is the actual corporate relationship between the entities. For example, the 
the key determining factor that seems to be at play in the in the decisions where the courts have refused to impute the 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 operations of an affiliate to other def- related defendants is the fact whether there is formal separation between these two corporate entities for example do they maintain different financial books do they have you know separate corporate legal structures that are maintained as such and 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 those kind of factors are are relevant in in trying to determine whether the the activities of one entity can be imputed to another the the last issue that we're going to touch on and this is our last slide uh will be pendant venue and this is a topic where uh so just just as background the pendant venue doctrine it allows courts to hear claims as to which venue is lacking if those claims arise out of the same and here's the 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 legal phrase that is the magic legal phrase out of the same common nucleus of operative facts as other claims to which venue is proper so an an example is if you were to plead patent infringement and along with that you also plead um let's say unfair competition which is which which can be let's say pled such that it is proper in the in the state court or in the district in 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 the state where that unfair competition occurred then can you also tie your patent infringement claim to that such that you would have venue proper properly in that district and here only a few cases right now have addressed this issue but most courts have rejected this approach on tying on trying to tie venue for patent infringement cases based on other claims that are not patent infringement so in in summary um in summary there the tc hartland decision has certainly changed the landscape in terms of where people are thinking of filing new cases the redistribution of cases across districts but it has also in the year that has almost a year that has passed since that decision left a lot of questions that remain unanswered and the law will continue to develop in this area in the months to come so with that we'll take um questions Yeah, thank you Raj and Christine for the wonderful presentation. Uh very uh, informative and the interesting uh topic here. Um and um as we can see, uh TC Harland uh, this case has certainly made a major impact in the decision making process for litigants uh regarding where to file patent cases. So my first question here uh is that uh what do you see as the next development that may affect the choice of district court? in which to file cases um i i think one of the most important uh factors is going to be monitoring closely the caseload of these of these district courts as this redistribution of of cases takes place for instance the district of delaware has certainly increased the number of filings in its on its docket and the the district has four active judges normally but right now two of them are 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 not available in the sense that they've retired or they've gone senior status and therefore they have only two active district court judges and 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 the the time to trial will certainly get affected by the workload the case workload of these districts and based on that that may start to become a really important factor in in the decision making process for litigants to decide which district uh to really file cases in because the speed to which with which they get to trial is a very important consideration so we'll have to monitor the case load and the time to trial pretty closely okay great thanks raj 
Uh, Christine, I know you you are the expert in the ITC area. Uh, can you share with us uh, what other main uh, developments that uh, do we see will affect the decision to file the case in the ITC? Sure. So as I said, it's it's hard to pin down the increase in popularity of the ITC on any one factor uh, because it's such a unique jurisdiction, but. Uh, certainly, there are, we don't have the venue issues that TC Heartland presents in district courts, um, but also the, the lack of any stay for IPRs uh, has only gotten more uh, important, I think, as the ITC has sort of reaffirmed multiple times now that they are not going to stay case for uh, an IPR. Um, and now, with the recent Supreme Court decision in oil states, um, you know, to the extent anybody thought, well, maybe there was going to be an issue of constitutionality of the PTAB, um, that issue is is gone. So district courts will will continue to see those stay motions, um, but the ITC, uh, I think people have pretty much given up filing them uh, because it's just not they're not ending up being uh, granted. So I think that's probably the biggest factor. Um, and even the other Supreme Court uh, decision Im impacting IPRs, SAS, I think is also going to contribute to uh, the ITC just remaining popular. Okay. Um, I think we'll, our time is up. Uh, thank you again, Raj and Christine, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you all to, uh, for attending today's webinar, Choosing and Challenging Venue, District Court, and ITC. Uh, this presentation will be available on demand in the next week, and uh, please look for an email from us with the access link. Um, this concludes today's Finnegan's webcast. Thank you for participating, and we look forward to seeing you on July 11 with Finnegan's webinar series. Thanks.